Because, you know, your heart and your mind can be renewed, but they can't be replaced. You're supposed to renew your mind with God's Word. Never forget that. And the renewal of God's of your mind is something you do. You practice putting the Word in you so that your life can be presented to God as a willing sacrifice. So you choose to serve Him. You choose to obey Him. This is David James, and we're back at it, and we're talking about um, living a sanctified life. We're talking about a holiness unto the Lord, where we live separated unto the Lord, where we live uh, separate in such a way that our lives look different and are different from what's out there, that you look different than your neighbor. You live different than your neighbor. So we're in 2 Peter um, chapter 3, finishing up, and we're going to read out of the Passion again, 2 Peter 3, 14. So, my beloved friends, with all that you have to look forward to, may you be eager to be found living pure lives when you come into his presence. So, even if you don't believe that these are the last days, folks, these are your last days. Like I said yesterday, when you were four, all of a sudden, I became 64. And one day I'll be 74 and 84 and 94 and 104 if I live that long. That being said, even if you don't believe anything about the end times and that these are the last days of prophecy, which I do, these are your last days and you're going to meet him sooner than later. He's coming for you one way or the other and you will either go to him or you will go away from him. You must live your life in a way that's pure, that's just separate, that is set apart for him and sanctified so that he can use you while you're here and you're glorified when you're with him because he wants to use you. He wants to bless your life. He wants to flow through your life. Now, it says he wants to, you to be, to be find, found living pure lives when you come into his presence without blemish and filled with peace. Do you want to leave your body with a dread? Do you want to all of us, like, if you get the chance, some people are taken like that in a car crash. Some people are taken like that in ways that, that uh, is totally unexpected. If you do get the chance and you're on your deathbed or you think about dying all the time because you're so sick, do you want to have that dread in your heart? Do you want to live with that dread of what's coming? Because you don't know and you're not sure because of the way you've lived and the way you've thought. You want to live that way? What a torment. It says here, keep in mind our Lord's extraordinary patience. Simply means more opportunity for salvation. So when things think, when you think things seem to be taking a long time, it's not because he's allowing evil to continue unchecked. Things seem to be taking a long time because he's giving people an opportunity for salvation. Just as our dear brother Paul wrote to you with the wisdom God gave him, he consistently speaks of these things in all his letters, even though he writes some concepts that are overwhelming to our understanding, which the unlearned and the unstable love to twist to their own spiritual ruin as they do the other scriptures. Interesting here that Peter calls Paul's writing scripture. Just as Deuteronomy and Psalms um, and Isaiah are scripture, he calls Paul's writings scripture. He recognized it even then as the word of the Lord. That's Peter. But as for you, divine dear loved ones, since you are forewarned of these things, be careful that you are not led astray by the error of the lawless. So if you feel like you're in a lawless atmosphere, run from it. Run for your life. If you're in a church that seems to allow all kinds of crazy stuff that the world is walking in, run from it. Run away. 
It says here, yeah, be careful that you are not led astray by the error of the lawlessness, lawless, and lose your firm grip on the truth, but continue to grow and increase in God's grace and intimacy with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. May he receive all the glory now until the day eternity begins. So, God's grace is not a license for you to do whatever you please because you know he's forgiven you for everything. Yes, there is forgiveness. There is grace to live a holy life. There is forgiveness and grace to walk in the plans and purposes of God as he's established it. There is not grace as a license to do what you please and God just, he's not even looking at it. He doesn't care about your sin. If you're listening to preachers like that or a church like that where you think God doesn't care about sin, you are in a dream world and you need to wake up and run for your life. Now, don't forget, the error of the lawless will cause you to lose your firm grip of the truth. I love that. Let's look at that in the Amplified. I don't even know what it says, but I know it's going to be good. Grow in the grace. Oh yeah, we're going to go. Verse 17. Let me warn you, therefore, beloved, that knowing these things beforehand, you should be on your guard, lest you be carried away by the error of the lawless and wicked persons and fall from your own present firm condition your own steadfastness of mind. So if you're convinced of the gospel and the truth and the hope and the faith that's been presented to you from the scriptures and someone is leading you another way that just seems like a, a detour, run for your life, but grow in grace. That is undeserved favor and spiritual strength. So it, your grace that you've received from the Lord isn't just undeserved favor but it's a spiritual strength to walk in all that he's called you to, all that he's asked of you. He's asked of you to walk in the grace and the strength and the favor of God in a way that can only be accomplished by you adhering to the truth, to know what it says. You will know the truth. The truth shall make you free and it will keep you free. But only what you know and apply in your life. Don't forget, James said, be doers of the word and not hearers only. Deceiving yourself. If you don't do what this book says, you're walking in deception. You're walking in a lie. You have convinced yourself of something that is simply not true. And you can't afford it. You can't afford to waste your spiritual life. And you could lose your life because you may have been called to salvation. Do you know every person on earth has been called to salvation? But you have to make a choice to live in it. you got to make a choice to walk in it. God doesn't just ignore every evil thing that can, you continue to practice. You know, those who practice lawlessness will go to hell. Those who practice sin will go to, go to hell. You know, I've made mistakes. I felt sorry for them when I do. I, I feel bad for my spiritual condition. That's a repentant heart. So through all my mistakes, I didn't want to do it. But if you're in that condition, there's grace to walk in the victory that Christ gives you. There's grace to walk in it. But if you've made a practice of it and you just keep doing it, and your conscience, we read earlier, your conscience becomes seared. Are you doing something so long and so often that now it feels like you're, you got a burnt, you know, your brain is burnt on top and nothing can get through. It's like it's scalded. Like, you know, when you put a steak on the grill and you want those grill marks, right? You want those nice grill marks? Why? What's one of the reasons you do that other than it looks cool? You do that to lock in the juices, right? to keep it from seeping out. So you want to lock in the moisture so that your steak doesn't dry out unless you're one of those crazy people that likes their steak well done. Okay, so you want to be able to have um, something where what's inside isn't burnt, isn't overdone, isn't, isn't too well done, 
uh, isn't scorched, where your heart and your mind become seared and overdone. So you're literally, you come out, it's like walking away from the grill for 20 minutes and you didn't pay attention to it. It's going to come back. You got, you got charcoal and it's, you can't even scrape it off. It just, it's going to go in the garbage and you're going to have peanut butter sandwiches. So pay attention to these things. Okay. We're going to start picking it up right away in the book of Jude. Now, Jude, uh, for those of you that don't know, his name is actually Judas. Um, and he is the Lord's brother. So he's actually the blood brother of James, who wrote the, the book of James, the, the, the epistle of James. His name is actually Jacob. So you got Jacob and Judas. Those are two of Jesus' brothers. And they both wrote letters. So the James you read about here um, in, in the book of James is, is not the James of James and John. So the, the two fishermen, this is not that James. So um, this particular James is also the Lord's brother. But Jude and James are brothers, and Jude wrote a very powerful gospel. Um, we learn from history that um, both James and Jude were books that they tried to reject from the canon of Scripture. That they said, this is not gospel, we're not going to include it as, as, as canonical and, and the truth of, the, of God's word. So it was actually rejected um, more than once, I know. Uh, from what I've read and from what others have said who've actually studied these documents. Now, Jude is an interesting guy because he, he comes across, listen to this. Here's what he calls himself. Now, we're reading from the Amplified Classic. Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ, the Messiah, a servant of Jesus, and brother of James, writes this letter to those who are called, chosen, dearly loved by God the Father, and separated and set apart and kept for Jesus Christ. He didn't say, I'm Judas, I'm the Lord's brother. Yeah. No, he didn't. That's not part of his credentials. He didn't make a deal that he, no, he's, he's a servant of Jesus Christ. So he's his own brother, grew up in his house. He calls himself a servant of Jesus Christ because he came to faith later. Okay, we know that Jude. This Jude came to faith later, after his resurrection at some point, or, you know, shortly before. We don't know. But we do know he's a, he's, he became a leader in the, in the church, in the body of Christ, and he calls himself a servant of his blood brother, his half-blood brother, right? And brother of James. So the, the, both James and Jude grew up in the house with Jesus. Imagine. Can you even like wrap your head around it? The stuff they saw, the stuff they thought. Now, he's, we are of those who are loved by God, the Father, and separated and kept for Jesus Christ. May mercy, soul peace, and love be multiplied to you. Beloved, my whole concern was to write to you in regard to our common salvation. So his whole purpose going into writing this letter was he was going to talk about the elements of salvation, the common salvation that we've all shared and, and the glories of it. He says, but I found it necessary and was impelled to write you and urgently appeal to and exhort you to contend for the faith which was once and for all handed down to the saints. This is the same faith, which is that sum of Christian belief, which was delivered verbally to the holy people of God. He's talking about contending for the faith. So he set out to write a scripture just about the elements of salvation in some respect and encourage the, the flock. But he says he was impelled to urgently appeal and exhort for the contention of the faith. Now, verse 4. Does this sound like 2 Peter that we've just been reading? For certain men have crept in stealthily, gaining entrance secretly by a side door. That sounds like the gospel when Jesus said that anyone who comes in some other way through another door is a thief and a robber. Because the thief doesn't come in your front door unless you've left it wide open and gone to sleep. He comes in a side door. He comes in a window. He comes in a back door. 
And that's how every thief will enter, typically. Now, he's talking about those that come into your midst and they've got something to say and they're saying it in such a way that isn't founded upon the faith, upon the scriptures. And we're going to stop this one right here. Um, we've given it an introduction in Jude and we're going to keep going. Thank you for watching and I will see you on the next one. Bye for now. you to get one of my free Bible reading plans right now. It's a free download at thrivingintheendtimes.org. There is a 365 day plan. There is a 180 day plan. There is a 90 day plan. And what makes these plans so exclusive is you read from one of three different sections of the Bible every day. So you start in Genesis, Psalms, and Matthew. You read through each section to the end of it, and by the time you get to the very end of your section, you're done and you've read the Bible through in 90 days, you've read it through in 180 days or 365 days. This will make the Word of God and reading it um, not a dread, not a chore, but something that you're excited to do where you can get the entirety of God, God's Word in you right now. You can do it. You can start right today. Get your free download now.